Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And on your screen right now, as it has been so often these past few weeks, is the logo of Activision Blizzard. Now, over the past few weeks, we've primarily been talking about Activision in the context of their imminent potential purchase by Microsoft, certainly as announced. But today we're going back to what essentially led to Microsoft purchasing them and the loss in the Activision stock price, which is our playlist, Activision Under Fire, a legal view. No, it's not our playlist specifically, but it is the events that are covered in this playlist. Of course, starting off with California and their Department of Fair Employment and Housing suing Activision for sexual harassment, pay discrimination, and a host of other items of that ilk. Now, what we're going to talk about today is actually the federal lawsuit against Activision brought by the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And you can check out the details for all of these things in this playlist. But what you need to know for this video is that California's lawsuit is still pending. California thinks that its lawsuit is worth a lot more than what the EEOC wants to settle with Activision for, which is about $18 million. California, as we point out, towards the end of this playlist, has recently announced a settlement decree with Riot Games for about $400 million. That's the eyesight with which they are looking at this particular lawsuit against Activision and has attempted over multiple court documents to try to intervene with the EEOC's proposed settlement with Activision. That's a separate lawsuit. California suing Activision and the EEOC suing Activision. Those are different court filings. One is federal, the EEOC. One is state, the state of California. And California has continued to come in and try to intervene with that. Now, before we get to the details of why this particular video is entitled in its thumbnail format, California Loses Its Mind, I do want to remind folks that this is a Patreon-supported channel. If you enjoy this conversation, either now or at the end of it, please consider supporting us at Patreon. We've got wonderful tiers there, including a tier that allows you to sponsor a video per month. And that sponsor for this video is Falcus Vipest, which I want to offer my special thanks. They have been supporting the channel now for a number of months. I cannot do it without viewers and listeners like you, and I am so, so appreciative. So if you do want to check that out, please do look at our Patreon. There are other ways to support the channel listed below. And thanks again to Falcus Vipest. Now, as I mentioned, the last time that we actually looked at these court filings was with California getting denied by the federal court in its attempt to intervene. That federal court actually announced that in some stuff that we covered in December, middle of December, December 15th, and then had a document that went out denying California's attempt here. They say, the court must allow intervention as of right where the intervening party claims an interest relating to the property or transaction, certainly California has claimed it, that is the subject of the action and is so situated that disposing of the action may as a practical matter, impair or impede the movement, that's California, ability to protect its interest, unless existing parties, like the EEOC, adequately represent that interest. Now, the interests claimed by the DFEH are, as the court describes them, a general interest in upholding the rights of California citizens and an interest in protecting DFEH's ability to prosecute its own parallel state court case based on California law. Specifically, DFEH seeks to challenge the voluntary claims process that the consent decree would establish and argues that the consent decree would release California state law claims and allows or potentially even requires defendants to destroy evidence relevant to DFEH's state court case. And we've talked about basically all of those issues in this space already. I don't want to relitigate, no pun intended, those particular items. You can check out the playlist for them. But this is going to lead to the state of California doing some things that are very, very unusual as the court denies them their attempt to intervene. The court does this because it says the first interest belongs to the individuals who might make claims under the claims process, not to the DFEH. And the DFEH's argument would allow it to potentially intervene in almost any employment action in California. That's right. If the state of California can just say we have an interest in not allowing people to release claims because we might otherwise be able to bring a litigation, there is nothing that they couldn't intervene in that is at all related to the employment process in California, which is not how all of this is supposed to work. This case will also not, as a practical matter, says the court, impair or impede the DFEH's ability to protect its interests. Aside from the speculative evidence destruction argument, which we already talked about, really and truly is speculative. Both the EEOC and Activision have said, we're not destroying anything. We're just moving things in files as required by 
what the consent decree says. The proposed consent decree will not and could not affect DFEH's ongoing litigation against defendants. And even if DFEH had some interest in ensuring that the proposed claims process for individuals provided adequate and just compensation, nothing in the consent decree would appear to prevent the DFEH from reaching a separate agreement with the defendants. Remember that the DFEH in this particular context is really concerned with these individuals deciding that they want their piece of the EEOC pie and they're willing to release everything related to it. But the court has said here, that's up to the individuals, which it really and truly is. And the DFEH can continue to prosecute for those that don't release or for items that aren't otherwise released. So they don't have an interest in this particular case. Now, I can't highlight this page because it's a picture due to it having a signature, but the court does give the DFEH some rights. It says the motion to intervene is denied. While the court finds that formal intervention is not appropriate, the DFEH has enough of a general public interest in the subject matter of this lawsuit and its resolution that the court will allow the DFEH to present its position as to the proposed revised consent decree via an amicus brief. This is a brief that ostensibly is brought by a friend of the court to help the court understand certain technical or legal issues and is not, and this is important, is not a brief on behalf of a party. It's not supposed to argue things necessarily other than to inform the court. Now that isn't a bright line that can get run across in certain various ways, but what we will see from what California actually filed with the court doesn't look anything like an amicus brief as I have seen it. While DFEH will not have the rights of a formal party to the action, its concerns can be expressed succinctly through this mechanism and will be considered by the court. DFEH's position, which may not exceed 15 pages, must be filed no later than 14 days from the filing of the revised proposed consent decree, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the court goes in and does what it says it would do when we talked about it in this earlier video. They deny the motion to intervene. California is not a party to this action. And then California does something interesting. <laughs> It files a notice of appeal with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals asking to appeal this court's order denying that motion to intervene, which is going to kick off a process that is going to be part of what we talk about today. This is filed almost a couple of days after the court actually decides that they can't intervene in this particular court action. And then the state of California files its quote unquote amicus brief. What you will see here is actually captioned like it's a party to the action. It requests a hearing date on February 7th, which would have been yesterday. And it's titled California Department of Fair Employment and Housing's Objections to Approval of Proposed Amended Consent Decree. That's not what an amicus brief is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be, hey, we're the friends of the court. We're going to talk to you about some things that we think you might otherwise get wrong if we don't mention it. It's instead titled as objections, which very much looks in certainly in form and caption and everything else like the state of California believes it's a party or that it should be a party. So the state of California is effectively ignoring that the court has said that you are not a party to this transaction. Instead saying, hey, we are a proposed intervener, that effectively we were unjustly denied our right to intervene. And that's gonna be a part of the story here. That's where California is already acting just oddly, clearly almost emotionally offended by what the EEOC is doing. And understand the background here, which is that all states basically have some kind of EEOC equivalent. In California, it's the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. The EEOC and the DFEH have to work together on all sorts of things. This kind of breakdown in trust and sniping and attacking each other in legal documents is, at least in my experience, highly unusual and certainly looks bad for the entirety of the enforcement of these laws at either the state or the federal level. Why? Because the state of California has this document that effectively accuses the EEOC of acting almost in a criminally fraudulent capacity. The word collusion is thrown around. The EEOC will defend itself and say, this is ridiculous. This is directly harming our reputation. And I have to admit, I am more likely to side with how the EEOC is treating this, not from coming out of a neutral standpoint here, but because the state of California doesn't have a good argument. This consent decree with the EEOC remains individually opt-in oriented. If those people don't like whatever amount the EEOC will get them, don't want to release any of their claims, they don't have to. 
So we're going to be talking about this a little bit. We're going to give some credence to what the DFEH says here. I've got some highlights. Important to note, we're not going to go through all of these documents, and I have a number of them as substantively as we have other documents in this playlist, primarily at the substantive level here in the top line documents. They're arguing the same things. DFEH says, this is unfair, it's collusive, it's a problem. The Activision will say, no, it's great. The EOC will say, no, we, we settled this for various reasons. We're going to be looking a little bit more often in this video at the footnotes. And if you've been to law school or if you've just been in virtual legality for a while, you know that the footnotes are often where the fun lives. It's where they tend to snipe each other a little bit more. It's where you get the weird references. Uh, and that is most definitely the case here. So let's take a look at what the EEO says. From any vantage point, EEOC and Activision's announced resolution is not only unfair, inadequate, and unreasonable, it is designed to undermine DFEH's state government enforcement action, ignore the protections of stronger state laws, enable Activision to escape accountability, and abrogate principles of federalism. So the DFEH comes in here and says, they are actually trying to impugn the sovereignty of the state of California. EEOC and Activision collude to do exactly that. The amended decree now requires over 13,000 claimants across the country to complete a 17-page claim form, approve the destruction of evidence, and then release all state law claims they might have that were not and could not be alleged in EEOC's complaint nor bargained for by the EEOC. In return, claimants may receive as little as a few hundred dollars. Now, this paragraph is nuts in and of itself. The amended decree doesn't require any individual claimants to do anything, including all these things. The actual reference to destruction of evidence is in and of itself overly rhetorically hyperbolic, that there isn't any destruction of evidence contemplated in the consent decree. And in fact, it uses standard and appropriate language that the EEOC often uses to protect the individual claimants in the case that they do accept a claim uh, in this particular instance. And then there's nothing on how the math arrives at a few hundred dollars or how that might be distinct from a California lawsuit, especially if a California lawsuit were to be lost, which is always a risk. You might think Activision is the worst company on earth. I might agree with you, but there's always a risk that the litigation doesn't go the way that you expect and that you don't win the massive, massive trial that you think you will, right? California has settled with Riot. That didn't even go to trial. Would it, what would have happened at trial? We don't know. But the DFEH continues, this is an unfair, collusive, and illegal deal. Th these are not lightly worded complaints in this quote-unquote amicus curiae brief that the DFEH has filed. The decree is unlawful under this circuit's precedent. Decades ago, the Ninth Circuit made clear that the EEOC has no power to extinguish state claims or state statutory rights. In fact, the EEOC, we will see, argues that it doesn't do anything like that. And in fact, doesn't even try. The individuals can, of course, release whatever claims that they choose to release. This continues. And as I said, a lot of this substantively is the same kind of arguments that we've seen. The decree requires participants to release unlitigated claims. We don't actually see that in practice in the documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And again, towards the end of this document, you get the same kind of reference to destruction of evidence, right? You have the proposed decree provides a highly unusual provision blessing Activision's re rewriting of its business records to erase evidence of discrimination, even though this evidence is relevant to DFEH's ongoing state action. Of course, as we've talked about here in virtual legality, everything that relates to that state action can't otherwise be destroyed. This doesn't provide that cover, and it's not unusual. It's within the EEOC's sample settlement that you allow the individual claimants to move things that are otherwise discriminatory towards them in the final records that are held by the company outside of their files. That would still be retained for litigation purposes. EEOC has pledged that to the court here, uh, and certainly DFEH is wrong in what it is accusing the EEOC of doing here. But everything else is as we expect, just with much, much stronger language. And so that's the amicus curiae brief. It doesn't match up with what you would expect. Remember, it was limited to 15 pages. What they did was close it off in page 13 and then provide an appendix with another six or seven pages offering other arguments against what the EEOC is doing in a very unusual fashion in this brief, winding up with 25 pages of document as opposed to the 15. And you just see the state of California doing what it likes with what a court ordered them to do, obviously feeling like the court isn't going to do anything bad against them for writing it longer than was asked for in a different fashion, et cetera, et cetera.
But that's not where our story ends. No, at the same time, the state of California is also seeking a motion to stay proceedings. Here, this document is entitled California Department of Fair Employment and Housing's Notice of Motion and Motion to Stay Proceedings. What does that mean? They are asking to have this case stopped, that the EEOC and Activision cannot settle their concerns. They cannot enter into this settlement agreement. That 18 million can't be distributed. An EEO consultant can't be placed. All of the rules that the EEOC would otherwise require of Activision can't go into place until the Ninth Circuit has heard the state of California's appeal that they should be allowed to intervene directly in this case. Or as the DFEH says, a stay is essential to preserve proposed intervener DFEH's protectable interests in the California claims that may be released by the proposed consent decree and in the court holding a fairness hearing. Understand, the state of California has been held by this court to not have a cognizable legal interest in this particular action. So they are using formalistic documentation here to pretend that they are a party, to call themselves something that isn't real, a proposed intervener, and asking to have the court decide to stop proceedings while their appeal goes through the Ninth Circuit. As we've talked about in other cases here in virtual legality, like Epic versus Apple, Ninth Circuit sometimes takes a while to rule on these various things. So when you ask for a stay here, you're asking for a stay of indeterminate duration, which Activision and the EEOC will comment on in their own documents. And they're asking for it outside of the bounds of actually formally being a party to this particular uh, court litigation. In evaluating a proposed stay of a pending action, says the DFEH, courts must weigh the competing interests affected by granting or denying a stay. Here, DFEH's interests include preserving state law claims that seek to vindicate both the rights of Activision employees and the interests of the California public. In contrast, Activision's primary interest appears to be to evade accountability as soon as possible. Now, this is footnoted. This is why I highlighted this. But what could you imagine would possibly be the evidence of a footnote for Activision's primary interest in, remember, this is related to the EEOC transaction, in entering into an EEOC settlement agreement is to evade accountability. Well, if you guessed that it was a reference to the Microsoft merger agreement, congrats uh, and welcome to virtual legality. California is acting really, really weird in all of this. And they footnote, the agreement and plan of merger buying among Microsoft Corporation, Anchorage Merger Sub, and Activision Blizzard dated as of January 18th, 2022, and particularly in parenthetical, a reference to the rep and warranty given by Activision that there are no allegations of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, or retaliation. To the knowledge of the company, the company and each of its subsidiaries have not been party to a material settlement agreement entered into since January 1st, 2018 with a current or former officer or employee resolving material allegations of sexual harassment. And then the rep continues. Now, what's really, really odd about this is that the state of California are professional attorneys, right? I know this surprises you in some respects when we look at this documentation, but they have training as lawyers. That doesn't mean they have training as mergers and acquisitions lawyers, although you would hope that within their agency, there would be some knowledge of how corporate transactions work. But when we look at this particular footnote, I can't help but point to my video that talked about what's in a merger agreement, including what do reps do and what do they not do? In fact, the state of California, if I were to guess, appears to be reading through Twitter threads more than actually making legal arguments by the time you get to this footnote, right? Here we have Stephen Tatilio of Axios, good journalist, sometimes gets things wrong as we all do as human beings. It says, fascinating Activision SEC filing about the merger no material allegations of sexual harassment since 2018. And he starts to expound on that in this thread. He says, well, we don't know what we don't know, but this appears to be pretty broad language, et cetera, et cetera. And the state of California appears to have missed when Stephen Totillo actually finished his thread as I commented to him just to kind of correct the record here saying, you can't actually read representations as definitively as you do. Each will be subject to a disclosure schedule that will serve as an exception to the representation. This is a 100% standard M&A procedure. You can look at this in the merger agreement that says, we're going to give you a letter. It will be confidential. It won't be public. It won't be in these SEC filings. And it will state exceptions to every statement that we make. And if there aren't exceptions, I will tell you in practice, it will say none so that we, don't, we all know, all parties of the transaction know that we didn't skip that. We didn't miss it. We're saying there are no exceptions to this statement that we made. A disclosure letter or a disclosure schedule is often called a schedule of exceptions. 
In fact, when Activision actually goes out and talks about the merger agreement with its own investors, it says the assertions embodied in the representations, warranties, and covenants contained in the merger agreement were made only for purposes of the merger agreement. That this isn't some kind of under oath truth statement to the court or anyone else. It's a risk allocation device as between two parties, one of which is going to expend almost $70 billion and when and how they should get that money back or withhold it if there's a breach of one of these particular representations and warranties. They're made solely for the benefit of the parties and may be subject to limitations agreed upon by those parties, including being qualified by information in a confidential disclosure letter. Accordingly, the reps and warranties in the merger agreement should not be relied upon by any persons as characterizations of the actual state of facts and circumstances. And I did this video. You can check it out. And a number of you said, hey, doesn't that mean you're hiding the ball? No, it's just the way that actual mergers and acquisitions agreements have come into being to assure that you get broad reps and warranties and that the company actually has to do due diligence on its own to determine when it should disclose exceptions to those. And then those exceptions can be evaluated by the proposed acquirer. That is fully normal. And yet I'm sitting here looking at a legal document that attempts to use it as some evidence of evading accountability, which doesn't relate at all to the actual act of Activision entering into an EEOC settlement agreement and instead is seemingly random from an actual legal organization in the state of California. And we do see Activision respond to this as you would expect that they would. They have their own document. We're not going to read through it all. It's the standard kind of arguments that we have seen now in video after video here. But they do point out exactly what I just did. DFEH's footnote reference to disclosures made in the proposed merger agreement between Activision Blizzard and Microsoft Corporation are of no value. As is typical in such transactions, there are confidential disclosure schedules to the merger agreement that set forth exceptions to and modifications of the reps and warranties in the merger agreement, nor do the representations or disclosure schedules made in a different context for a different purpose suggest that Activision Blizzard seeks to quote unquote evade accountability in any way as DFEH speculates. And that's, I believe, all I wind up taking from the Activision document because it's what you would expect. Hey, we're giving up a lot to the EEOC. This should all be allowed, et cetera, et cetera. But when you actually start to evaluate what the state of California is doing here, you get crap like this. And I say crap, not to be disparaging, but because it's literal, actual legal crap. None of this matters and is designed to obfuscate what the DFEH's position is in a way that I personally find very untoward in terms of using the judicial system. Now they continue, as I said, a stay will preserve the interest of the parties and promote efficiency. This will help us in the absence. DFEH will be prejudiced. State law releases in the proposed decree would impede the vindication of state law claims. And then they finish off with a footnote that says, these concerns were echoed by the Communication Workers of America, AFL-CIO-CLC. And as we talked about in the video where we commented on the fact that the CWA had included a brief in this particular case, they don't have standing at Activision as of yet. We've done a number of videos with respect to whether or not certain aspects of Activision will unionize, more specifically the Raven QA workers. But the Communication Workers of America interested kind of broadly in potentially unionizing Activision as a union shop doesn't have standing to just step in here and say, this is a bad thing. They do have a kind of amicus position, but that wasn't recognized before they filed their document. And so including it here is just suggestive of the state of California moving forward with this very, very strong language about collusion and about what the EEOC is doing and making claims based on nothing, based on misunderstanding of merger agreements, bringing in things that don't relate to this at all. And then you wind up getting the EEOC's response. Now, the EEOC is, I'm going to tell you, going to be very vicious here. The EEOC clearly feels put upon since the state of California attempted to intervene. We saw it get very ugly, very dirty, very nasty when the EEOC actually brought a complaint that there were ethics violations from the lawyers leaving their employee and joining the state of California's. That went silent for a little while after that all ended. Activision tried to get a stay of their own proceeding in California. That was denied. All these various things. But now that the state of California has brought an amicus curiae document, that is objections and a proposed intervener and all this stuff that the court could not have possibly intended when they filed their order, now that they have accused them of acting illegally, colluding with Activision to do these various things in a formal filed legal document, the evidence of what they want 
presupposed on various misconstruing aspects of the settlement agreement itself of bringing in things like the merger agreement with Microsoft to impugn Activision and what the EEOC would allow Activision to do leads you all to this, an EEOC document that is absolutely full of footnotes about how California is upsetting the natural order of these judicial items and how, in my opinion, it looks like the California DFEH and the EEOC are going to have to go to couples counseling or something after all of this because they have to work together under the statutes that they operate under. And I'm not sure how they're going to do it after these documents uh, get done. So as I said, substance wise, we're going to skip most of it. EEOC says, hey, it's within our ambit to enter into settlement uh, agreements. And the state of California is wrong. Court has already decided this. Uh, one aspect that I did want to highlight is they say amicus curiae who have been denied intervention do not have standing to move to state proceedings pending their appeal of denial of intervention. That denial of intervention is essentially an existential kind of denial. If you're not allowed to be a party to the proceedings, you're not allowed to intervene as if you were. Uh, and that includes requesting a stay of those proceedings. And they have what we call a string site here in order to hammer home how many times that has been decided. Entity denied intervention, lacked standing to seek stay of proceedings pending appeal of denial of intervention. Amicus lacked standing to stay proceedings pending its appeal of denial of intervention, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they do the right thing in terms of filing a legal document. They do have a but C. It has been allowed in one recent case, November 2020, in the Central District of California. And you can try to distinguish those uh, court and figure that out. But the overall notion is that when you say they can't intervene, they can't ask you to stop your proceedings while they wait to see if they can intervene. And this is an important kind of argument because as we talked about, the Ninth Circuit isn't necessarily going to move with much alacrity, much speediness on behalf of the state of California. And if this proceeding at the EEOC level isn't stayed, then chances are Activision and EEOC can enter into their settlement agreement. And by the time the state of California might otherwise get to appeal their position, it would be moot. In fact, they'd probably drop it if they lost this stay. Although who knows uh, with what the state of California is doing and, and how they're operating today. EEOC continues, DFEH's stay would dis deserve the public interest to no practical end. Entry of a stay will harm the public. A stay would harm potential claimants. DFEH is waging a disruptive campaign of interference with far-reaching adverse impacts. The longer it is allowed to continue, the longer harmed individuals wait for monetary compensation, and the longer defendants' workforce waits for oversight and enforcement of much-needed non-monetary reforms. Your Honor, the DFEH keeps trying to block this because they want their own big litigation, but right now we have a settlement on the table that would put us in the room would let us review their hiring and firing policies and everything else in between. And that's getting stopped because the state of California, as they're going to argue, wants more money. And who am I to say that EEOC is wrong on this? The DFEH continues to speciously argue, that means lying in legal talk, that EEOC seeks to force waivers of state law claims on individuals and release claims beyond those asserted in the EEOC's complaint. Footnote two. DFEH conflates EEOC's release in the consent decree with the voluntary release by individual claimants. DFEH argues that participating claimants will release claims beyond those sharing a factual predicate with the claims asserted in EEOC's complaints, i.e. harassment, pregnancy, discrimination, and related retaliation, because EEOC in its separate release with defendants references the commissioner's charge. That's the document under which the EEOC operated its investigation. There is no dispute that the commissioner's charge, which predates DFEH's director's complaint. I, I like how they just fit that in there. Just for the record, the EEOC went first, Your Honor, included allegations of sex discrimination and unequal pay. EEOC did not investigate sex discrimination in pay claims pursuant to the agreement made between EEOC and DFEH to split the investigation regarding defendants. In resolving the commissioner's charge through the proposed consent decree, EEOC is agreeing that EEOC will not pursue the claims asserted in the charge any further. This is a standard release in the EEOC's and DFEH's consent decrees. This is what I mentioned in an earlier video in this series as the EEOC has to give Activision something. That's what a settlement is. Both sides agree on what either side is giving up and what they're getting. The EEOC says, if we get this money, if we get this control, if we have this three-year person in your offices, et cetera, et cetera, then we, the EEOC, are releasing the rest of any claims we might have against you. That's what Activision gets out of this. The scope of EEOC's release does not broaden the scope 
of individual claimants releases. And I think this is all justified. The EEOC is saying, look, yes, our release is broad. If you actually saw it as it was originally written, I mentioned it in the videos here, it was about the parties to the pr proceeding, that the EEOC was a party. The individual claimants aren't parties to that proceeding. They would actually be a part of a different claims process. So only the EEOC was releasing anything formally under the consent decree and when that would be originally signed. Footnote number three, the DFEH has no legitimate role in enforcing what it believes to be EEOC policy. DFEH cannot credibly argue that entry of the hard-fought comprehensive proposed consent decree is against EEOC's interests. Certainly, EEOC's long-term institutional interests are not well served by DFEH continuing to lodge false accusations against it. This is legal sniping, folks. The parties bargained for claimant's release of all sexual harassment claims because DFEH agreed that the EEOC would exclusively pursue those harassment claims. And then we get to footnote five. DFEH has spilled much ink attacking the $18 million class fund as paltry relative to the potential liability and strength of the case. DFEH posits that claimants may receive as little as a few hundred dollars without showing how it arrived at this figure. DFEH has never pro-offered a re realistic estimate as to the size of the class, the value of their claims, and the class fund that it would find acceptable. DFEH compares the proposed consent decree to a tentative settlement it has reached with Riot Games. This apples to oranges comparison is unhelpful to the court, workers, and the public. Comparing the Riot Games decree to the proposed consent decree here reveals the agencies made different strategic decisions in the resolutions based on their prosecutorial authority and expertise. The Riot Games decree uses a formula to compensate individuals based on their tenure and employment status. It requires individuals to release claims for sexual harassment and retaliation to receive compensation without assessing those individualized harms. So understand what the EEOC is saying here. The way the Riot Games settlement works is that if you worked at Riot Games and you fit some broad categories of qualification to be a member of the class, then essentially it's going to be a mathematical formula based on how long you were there and you're going to get a certain amount of money. As opposed to their consent decree, which they describe as follows, in the proposed consent decree, EEOC will assess each claimant's harms individually to award compensation from the class fund. Individuals will only release sexual harassment, pregnancy discrimination, and related retaliation claims. They will not release pay and discrimination claims. And this is the crux of what the DFEH is arguing. If you want to believe California and that the EEOC settlement is a concern, your primary argument is that it was unclear in the settlement decree exactly what they would be asked to release. It just isn't referenced, not with specificity. Here, the EEOC, admittedly in footnote form and not in the mainline text of the document, says individuals will only release the claims that they were investigating, which makes sense. It's really all that the EEOC has qualifications to release. They will not release the pay and discrimination claims, which would seem to form the heart of the DFEH's claim. Now, understand the DFEH also brought sexual harassment claims and that was part of the fight between the EEOC and the state of California is that they said that they had agreed that EEOC was going to handle the harassment claims and the state of California decided that they wouldn't go that route. So the state of California is still concerned that the EEOC will be asking them to release sexual harassment claims, but this is essentially an institutional and administrative fight over who had the rights to do these various things and which strategy would ultimately win the day. The Riot Games decree extinguishes approximately 2,365 class members' claims unless they affirmatively opt out. It's automatic. It's going to be math. Based on your membership in this class, you're going to get the money in that settlement, and that's it. Here, the EEOC says, parties have proposed a voluntary opt-in process expected to benefit hundreds of claimants. The Riot Games decree allocates millions from the class fund towards attorney's fees, costs, and penalties. None will be collected from the class fund here. The Riot Games decree pays a maximum award of approximately $80,000, whereas some claimants in the instant action, that is the EEOC settlement, will receive six-figure compensation up to, as we talked about with respect to caps, $300,000 plus back pay. That's the EEOC's description of what is happening here. And part of this is to establish for the court that that $400 million settlement that just includes everybody and caps out at $80,000 per, 
per the EEOC is not the same as what's happening here, which is you actually file what your issue was. It's evaluated by the EEOC and then they give a number to it. And Activision has given EEOC authority to do that through the settlement decree. The $18 million is gone to the Activision perspective and the EEOC gets to allocate that as they see fit within their statutory ambit. The other aspect of this footnote, obviously, between the lines, is to highlight some things that they find potentially problematic about this. That $80,000 cap, the fact that it's opt-out and not opt-in. Basically, differences in strategy that, for the most part, we don't want a state organization and a federal organization arguing about. Different lawyers are going to have different opinions on how to best realize change at Activision, how to best realize getting redress for those affected by the problems at Activision. And for the most part, we don't want these various agencies substituting their own judgment for each other. A stay would license DFEH's ongoing attacks on EEOC's integrity and prosecutorial ability. DFEH's insistence that it be permitted to intervene, not to litigate its own state law claims, which are pending in the state forum, but to quote unquote, ensure that its objections are given due weight undermines EEOC's autonomy to resolve cases under federal law. No, your honor, they just told you that we're the ones impugning the sovereignty of California. They're the ones that have a problem with federalism and they continue to attack and attack and attack, even though you've given a court order saying they can't intervene, they file an objections document, and now they are undermining our federal autonomy under our federal statutes to do what we have been given the charge to do. And like I said, in the middle of this video, I think the EEOC's argument on this is far stronger than the state of California's, which is effectively best premised on a kind of lashing out by the state agency. DFEH has demonstrated it has no misgivings about impugning EEOC's integrity and to stay will only prolong DFEH's rhetorical campaign against the EEOC. The DFEH claims that the EEOC colluded with defendants to reverse auction DFEH's state action a serious allegation without evidentiary support. Footnote six, according to the DFEH, defendants picked the most ineffectual class lawyers to negotiate a settlement. That is the EEOC, the Federal Civil Rights Enforcement Agency with 50 years of experience litigating Title VII cases. But DFEH's disagreement with EEOC's litigation strategy does not demonstrate that EEOC is ineffectual counsel. This is a freaking war between these agencies. And you got to love the IE talking about the EEOC and its history of enforcing Title VII cases, right? This is absolutely unusual for this. This is not standard. I don't want you to think that agencies are constantly fighting in the footnotes of their documents. This is, as best I can argue, the state of California deciding to cause a massive, massive issue and make an enemy out of the EEOC for at least some time. The EEOC raised legitimate concerns about former EEOC attorneys taking a position directly adverse to EEOC by opposing a consent decree in the very same matter they substantially participated in when employed by the EEOC. And then we'll go back to footnote seven here. This is the EEOC doubling down on the fees concept. EEOC statutorily never takes attorney's fees. The DFEH does, as demonstrated in the recent Riot Games decree, DFEH and the Division of Labor Standards Enforcement will take between five and 85 million dollars in attorney's fees for negotiating that settlement with Riot, which remember, they intervened in at a private class action level in order to get this five to $8.5 million payday. Now you might think that's justified. Certainly $400 million is better than I believe it was $10 million that Riot was initially going to settle for. So there does appear to be some validity in what they could get out of Riot. Uh, And your uh, mileage may vary as to whether or not that's a good thing, but certainly What the EEOC means to do in footnote seven here is to impugn the interest in terms of justice of the Department of Fair Employment and Housing and suggest that one of the reasons they are doing this is because they see that payday number going down if the EEOC is allowed to act within its own ambit. DFEH retained a consultant who rebuffed the EEOC's attempts to negotiate a resolution, denied the former EEOC's attorneys had a conflict without reviewing the EEOC's underlying evidence, and demanded 
that the EEOC waive that conflict. Now, this might seem like a sojourn into nowheresville, but what they're trying to get at here is that there was a fight behind the scenes about whether or not the EEOC had disclosed confidential information by including certain names and certain commentary from lawyers, which mostly are privileged in most contexts. Although when you add principal parties and various other things in those emails, it can be lost. I won't bother you with the details there, but what they're arguing in footnote eight here is important. They say the EEOC endeavored to resolve this dispute without litigation and minimal public scrutiny for the sake of all parties involved. We didn't want to fight the DFEH on this, but the DFEH mischaracterized the underlying facts to accuse the EEOC of collusion. And in so doing, it filed a letter from its consultant identifying those former EEOC attorneys. The DFEH opened the door. It cannot now complain that the EEOC has improperly made certain communications or information public. So part of what appears to be going on in communications that we can't necessarily see uh, and in declarations that are made before the court is that it would appear that the EEOC attorneys that left the EEOC to join the state of California are probably, and we're speculating here, parties to the notion that the Department of Fair Employment and Housing has gone out with that the EEOC was colluding with Activision to arrive at their settlement. Those are absolutely nasty, very ugly accusations from one agency to the other. And essentially, by looking at these particular folks that left one agency to go to the other, it's become even more ugly. And this might well blow up in a future litigation or potential problem between these two parties. Certainly, there is a fractured trust here, all really fomented by the state of California and its desire to not have the EEOC seemingly do anything. The DFEH made its objections, says the EEOC. DFEH has objected to the proposed consent decree in three separate filings, exceeded the limits this court set for its participation as amicus curiae, and proven itself to be an unreliable and biased commentator on these proceedings. Unlike the party, harmed individuals and the parties who will suffer great harm should the court enter a stay, DFEH will not suffer any harm or inequity absent a stay. Individual releases do not harm the DFEH, the EEOC argues. DFEH argues that in the absence of a stay approval of the consent decree allowing California workers to enjoy compensation from the $18 million class fund, if they so choose, EEOC highlighted, will prejudice the DFEH. DFEH's contention is misplaced and its implications are bold. The court correctly found that the DFEH has no cognizable interest in whether individuals voluntarily release state law claims with or without the DFEH the EEOC, or any attorney whatsoever. And we know this to be true, right? If you have a problem with your employer, you can always go in there, say, I have a problem with you, and they can offer you a settlement. Now, folks might have an issue with that. They have an issue with non-disclosure agreements. They have issues with what the companies might ask for in exchange for some kind of compensation. But in general, as a legal right, if you have a problem with your employer, you have the right to go in, sit down and say, oh yeah, I'll take 150,000. I'll give you an NDA if that's what works for you. That is always and everywhere the right that you have. And yes, at a broad level, that hurts the state of California's ability to bring a claim. You've got an NDA entered into place. You've got a release entered into place. And as we talked about with respect to the court's own document, if the court were to give credence to the DFEH's argument, DFEH would be entitled to intervene in every employment action across the Golden State. And I'd argue things that aren't formal employment actions. DFEH will not be harmed if individual employees opt to release their claims against defendants in favor of resolution and finality pursuant to the proposed consent decree or independently. Those are their rights. They are the ones that were harmed. And we shouldn't have giant agencies fighting over who gets to quote unquote win for them. Again, I find myself backing rhetorically and from a position standpoint, the EEOC's argument here. It is up to those that are actually harmed to decide how they choose to redress it And if they don't want to enter into the EEOC's agreement because they think they can get much more money from the state of California, they are free to do so. It's very difficult to see what point the state of California even has. Finally, the EEOC takes a a stance against how the DFEH used this whole process. They misused their amicus status to implicitly seek reconsideration of the court's order. The court gave the DFEH an inch by allowing for its limited participation as amicus curiae. DFEH took a mile by filing an overlong brief aimed at undermining the court's denial of intervention. Amicus Curiae, and this is a quote from another case, is an impartial individual who suggests the interpretation and status of the law, gives information concerning it, and advises the court in order that justice may be done, rather than to advocate a point of view so that a cause may be won by one party or another. Now, this is a very platonic 
somewhat naive interpretation of how amicus curiae briefs actually work in practice. If you've ever read them, they are very much arguing for a win from one side or the other. They're just not usually as obvious uh, as the state of California has done here, including here as footnote 10 notes. In the instant motion, DFEH refers to itself as proposed intervenor, not amicus curiae, apparently rejecting the role the court granted to it. DFEH titled its amicus filing objections, not brief of amicus curiae. Indeed, the word amicus is nowhere in the DFEH's objections document. DFEH even reserved a hearing for its objections against the court's express instruction that it would decide whether to hold such a hearing. And as you can see, the state of California has done itself no favors with how it has chosen to operate these particular documents. And, and that's really what I wanted to update folks on. This all happened pretty recently. You see a date here of February 7th. Some of the filings made by the state of California were earlier than that. But behind the scenes, over at Activision Blizzard, dealing with the EEOC and the rest of California versus Activision, you find yourself seeing a state of California that is making these big, reaching, very, very strong arguments against a federal agency that is ostensibly on its side. And it's something that I can admit in my experience, I have never, ever seen before. I, and it's something that I really think puts the state of California and the DFEH in a particularly bad light. This has been Virtual Legality for today. As I mentioned at the top, if you like these comments about pop culture, video games, technology, and more through the lens of business and law, please consider supporting the channel. We cannot do it without patrons and support from viewers and listeners like you. Special thanks again to Falkas Vipus for sponsoring this particular video. And if you'd otherwise just like to subscribe, ring bells, upvotes, downvotes, put us on Reddit, put us on the other forums that you might find yourselves in, tell your friends. Every little bit of growth for that subscriber number helps YouTube see us, gets us out to more people and sees that subscriber number grow even faster. So please do that. I am so, so thankful and grateful for every little bit that helps so, so much. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.